All right, uh, welcome to the Advisors webinar series. I'm Dr. Kevin Skinner with Addo Recovery. I wanna thank you for taking the time to participate with us today. At the end of the presentation, I will open it up for questions. So if you wanna uh, post some questions, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, I will try to get to them as I can. Uh, but this is a five-part series, and so this is our first time. But what I will tell you is over time, we'll be able to discuss uh, some of your questions. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am the uh, clinical director at Addo Recovery. I'm Dr. Kevin Skinner. I've, I've been doing therapy uh, for over 15 years. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And I'm also a CSAT, uh, which is a certified sexual addiction therapist candidate. I'm uh, working on finishing that up this year. I've done over about 15,000 hours of uh, cl clinical work as a clinician over the last uh, almost 20 years. And then uh, I've been doing research with individuals dealing with pornography and sexual addiction. And I have over 7,000 individuals uh, who struggle with addiction share their stories with me and uh, their experiences, and I've assessed them. And then I have about a thousand women who've taken what I call the betrayal trauma inventory. And so that's a little bit about me and my experience. Now, a couple of things that I would like to um, begin with today, my focus is going to be on understanding pornography and sexual addiction. In a month from now, I'll be talking about betrayal trauma and uh, typically what women are experiencing, but also some men when they discover their partner's pornography or sexual addiction. And then in the third month, I'll be talking about helping couples who are in crisis. Uh, if you're an advisor trying to figure out how to best help them, I'll be doing that in the third month. In the fourth month, I'll be talking about helping parents with uh, understanding with their teens who are trapped in pornography or sexually acting out. And what I found is parents really need additional support. And so in the fourth month, we'll be providing some guidance on that. And then in the fifth month, we'll be talking about teens and really how to interact with them, how to understand them, how to speak their language, and also how to forewarn them and protect them as much as possible. So that will be in the fifth month. So that's kind of an overview of these trainings. Now, let's get started. Understanding pornography and sexual addiction. One of the first things that I'm going to <clears throat> go over is kind of where we're headed today. And there are five core components that I'm gonna be discussing. First, as an advisor, what questions you should be asking or should you be asking. And then in the second uh, part of today, we're gonna to be talking about the signs of addiction. And what I've discovered is many people that might not know the right questions to ask. And even as a clinician, I've had to step back and ask the question, what is this person in front of me really experiencing? And so I'm gonna be addressing how we do that here at Addo and also how is a advisor you can reach out and ask them more important questions that will really help you get there. And I'll tell a short story about how um, I had to learn that lesson the hard way. In the third part of today, um, do they need more help than you can actually provide or give them? And that's a question that uh, we all have to address. Am I the best option for what this person is struggling with? Or can I be a part of their team, but not the key part of the team? Number four, when and where should you send them for proper help? And a lot of people are saying, where do I send th these individuals and how do I help them get the best help? I'll be talking about that. And then finally, what should the expectations be for recovery when someone comes to you as an advisor, what guidance and what should you expect? So those are the five parts that I'll be talking about today. And again, along the way, if you have questions related to these topics, please feel free to uh, send them to me. <clears throat> All right. so. What questions should you be asking? Well, as a clinician, I begin asking that question myself. What are the most important questions I can ask this individual who's coming in to me seeking help for pornography or for sexually acting out? And I began by saying, I need to understand their history. How long have they been involved in this? So I, I get a thor thorough background of their past and I'll give you some of those questions to that will help you. And then I look at the mind chatter. In other words, what's going on in the background, not just the behavior itself, but what's going on in the background of their mind. And then the other part is, who is a part of their support team? Are they dealing with this all by themselves? Are you the only person that they're talking to or reaching out for help? Or do they have a team around them? So the questions I'm gonna ask are gonna be around these areas. So 
One of the things that I created uh, in 2005 was an assessment that, again, over 7,000 people have taken this assessment. And it's kind of guided me over the years to help me understand what questions I need to be asking as an advisor in my situation as a professional therapist. So what is their history of involvement? And that question could go back clear to, I'll never forget the story of the boy, man, at this point, he was a man, but he said at age four, he was in another room and his mom actually brought him pornography because her and her boyfriend were having a tremendous fight in the other room. And his history, his first experience with pornography was his mom basically giving it to him as a coping mechanism so he wouldn't pay attention to the fighting that was going on in the other room. Now, obviously, as he got older, pornography became his comfort, and that's something that we began to look at and explore together. But many of the individuals that I work with dealing with pornography, as an example, they've been exposed to pornography by age 11. In fact, by age 13, my sample shows over 60% of them were exposed by age 13, and 40 plus percent uh, were exposed before age 11. So we want to understand their history of involvement. If it's a 20 or 30 or 40 year old person and they were first exposed at age 11, literally about half their life or more, if they're 30 or 40, has been literally that's been a part of their life. So we want to understand their history. The next question, we want to understand the type of pornography that they are looking at. And this is an absolute crucial question because many of the individuals what started uh, with J.C. Penney catalog, and literally when I first started on this, 1997 to 1998, I, the, those were the types of first exposures that people were getting. Now in my office, the first type of pornography is hardcore pornography through video clips. Now that is a very challenging starting point for many of these individuals because their first experience is often a very dominant one in their mind and they can get stuck on it as they move forward. So you want to understand the type of pornography, and that's a that's an important question. Most of the people, if it's pornography, they're gonna tell you that it was, uh, right now it's gonna be video clips, is typically the most frequent type of pornography. But then you also wanna ask them a better, a, a, a more questions. Are, are you aroused by same sex pornography? Are you aroused by heterosexual pornography? And you wanna be uh, even aware if, if, are they looking at child pornography and the risks of that? Because you want to protect them and educate them onto the risks. So sometimes asking the difficult question, the type of pornography, initially they may be hesitant, but in asking the question, you're asking for further details, which may be the first time they've actually ever told anybody the type of pornography that they're looking at. So don't just assume that they're looking at a pornography. For example, if they're dealing with same gender attraction and you don't know that, the question of the type of pornography will be helpful to you as an advisor. The next question, what are the current acting out behaviors? Now, I'll get a little bit more depth in this, but is it more than just pornography? Are they, are they doing other sexual behaviors besides masturbation? For example, are they uh, going out in public? Are they, uh, in a voyeuristic way, are they out in public acting out looking at pornography. I remember one young man who was in class uh, while the teacher's presenting was looking at pornography on his phone. Now, what did that do to the people around him? That, so you want to understand that type of behavior. So what are they, how are they currently acting out? And you also understand, want to understand when their behavior was at its worst. Now, my experience that that really tells you a lot about this a key stress time in their life and if they're involved in 12 step programs they're going to be doing a sexual background inventory and as a clinician i do this but also as an advisor if they're going to 12 step groups you could ask them to share part of their step 4 with you about their history which would be very helpful in understanding the long history of sexual behaviors that is a very helpful way to understand the depth of what they're truly experiencing. Now, more specific questions that I ask. What is the frequency that you viewed pornography or acted out in the past year? Now, I have a kind of a questionnaire on this, and you'll, you'll be able to have access to this 
uh, when I'm done, our team here at Addo will send it to you. But this question is extremely relevant. And let me tell you why. In my research with the 7,000 individuals, the individuals who are viewing daily are more depressed, more anxious, have higher stress, and are exceedingly lonely. So if you have an individual who you're working with whose frequency is almost daily, then you can assume that they're at a higher risk for those other issues, depression, anxiety, elevated stress, and loneliness. Now, I also found that individuals who view pornography three to five times a week, which, by the way, was the most frequent uh, response on that sample with 7,000 individuals. Their scores were also elevated, but not to the degree of somebody who's viewing it daily. So that awareness is very helpful. What is the frequency? What's the longest now moving down? What's the longest you've been without acting out in the past year? This is a helpful question because it helps you understand what it's like for them in the most recent part of their life. And if they tell you that they're acting out three to five times a week, sometimes you might need to guide them when you're talking with them. Is it daily? Is it once a week? Is it more than once a week? Is it once a month? And you really um, ask that type of a question, you're going to have a better understanding truly of what their history of involvement with pornography is. Now, the next part of it uh, is more of the mind chatter. How often do they experience these cravings? Now, someone might say, I'm only acting out maybe once a week, but you will have a lot better understanding if you ask, so if your behavior is once a week, how often are you dealing with cravings? That question all by itself can help you understand what's going on in what I call the background of their mind. How intense are those cravings? Are they fighting the battle daily, but they're only acting out once a week? That's a very big issue and can heighten your awareness. And I believe if you're an advisor, you really need to pay attention to the mind chatter or what's going on in the background and not just focus on the behavior. If you just focus on the behavior, uh, you might be missing a key part of what's really going on in their life and their mind. <clears throat> a person in recovery still has some mind chatter, but they're, they're experiencing cravings way less frequently. Uh, but a person who's really still struggling significantly if they're having uh, what I call intense cravings on a daily basis or multiple times a week, they're still in the earlier phase of their recovery and their healing. Now, the final part of this is, have they received support in the past? And the reason why I ask this question is because many times I've had people come into my office and they've been to three and four and five religious leaders or advisors or friends, and they feel like they haven't been given the guidance. And at this point, they're feeling quite hopeless. So understanding how many people they've talked to in the past and what was helpful and what wasn't helpful can be a very good thing to help you understand maybe things that you need to avoid doing or things that may be helpful. I had an individual who was dealing with quite a bit of ADHD. And without anybody else in the past addressing that, it was almost impossible for him to find any success because his ADD behaviors, I mean, he was just impulsive here and impulsive there, and nobody had addressed that question. And so it's important to understand the help that they've gotten in the past. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, having the proper diagnosis, asking them the question, did the support you receive help can be very helpful in helping you guide them to additional solutions. So I invite you to ask those questions. Did you get support in the past and was it helpful? Now let's look at some of the specific signs of addiction. And I'm going to be very clear here. There is a big debate in the field that I'm in of whether pornography or sexual addiction even exists. And I'm just simply going to say, I don't necessarily want to argue whether it's an addiction. I'm going to give you the signs that we want to look at, that we really want to hone in on. And if we are asking these questions, we're going to have a better feel of what this individual is dealing with. So I don't necessarily, I use the word addiction, but in truth, I don't really care if it's an addiction. I'm more concerned. They're sitting in front of me. I'm their helper. I care about them. Let's look at these signs. And if they're experiencing them, 
then they're going to be feeling out of control. And I want to help them feel in control. So here are the specific things that I look for. In my research, I, I actually use seven levels of addiction because it helps me understand. I don't believe a person's either addicted or not addicted. I believe that if we look at a continuum, I feel more out of control or less out of control. So again, I use the word addiction, but I use more, I believe we're more in levels. And so I'm looking at currently where they're at. I'm looking at their history. Are they currently in a highly acting out level or are they more in a sobriety level? So I'm going to address part of that. I looked at uh, basically their seven parts of their life. So I asked questions about their history of involvement, age at first exposure, when it was its worst. I asked the question, uh, what age uh, did you really struggle the most? And then I'll also ask, if we sum it up over time, how many times would you say that you've sexually acted out, looked at pornography? And that question all by itself, let's see if we do the math. I was age 11. I'm now at age 25, 14 years. I was acting out three times a week. You start doing the math with them on that. And then they begin to realize this is something I've done five, seven, eight hundred, a thousand times, fifteen hundred times. Now, as an advisor, you're able to really have a little bit more understanding. This is not just a minor issue for this person. This person has a long history of involvement. That awareness is incredibly important if you're going to be helping them and guide them in the right direction. Far too many individuals don't really get the depth of their history of involvement. And consequently, they have an individual who's two or three months sober and they're thinking, hey, they're on the right track here. They're moving forward. But what if their relapse pattern is every two or three months and they're really not emotionally feeling different? Their history of involvement would be helpful to understand there. Next is the beliefs and behaviors. One of the questions I asked on this was, do you believe that you can change? And that is a very important question because if they don't believe it's possible, they're at a point of hopelessness. And that's where, as an advisor, we need to be able to give them clear understanding that healing is possible and that many people recover. In fact, research shows that well over 50% of people overcome addictions. So people overcome addictive tendencies. We need to be able to give them that kind of hope. And we need to understand that as advisors to give them that guidance that if they will put in the effort and do the things that we're going to ask them to do and support them, that they can make tremendous progress. I also ask about their impact on social relationships. For example, I hold back from being in social settings when I've been viewing pornography or acting out sexually. You want to be able to assess that. And so I actually have assessed all of these categories, but I'm just giving you a sample of these questions on that social interaction. The impact on relationships. I actually broke it down to single and married people. It influences my marriage. It influences how I approach dating relationships. I ask those types of questions. An influence on their work ethic. I'm downloading pornography at work. I ask that question because I want to understand where they're acting out, how they're acting out. I stay up late at night at the expense of being tired at work or at school the next day. So those are questions that are in the assessment that help me assess and combine them together. And I put them in seven levels. So I'm looking at all of these areas, their emotions. I feel deep sadness because of my behavior. Uh, I, before I act out, I feel intense emotion. Afterwards, I feel sad. I, I'm trying to understand what's going on emotionally. And then sensitivity and spirituality. A question I ask is, if they're religious, I ask them whether they feel like God can forgive them. So those are sample questions that I look at. And there's uh, well over 40 questions that to take all seven of these categories into account. And then what I do is I sum them up and I break them up based upon frequency, their answers, and I come up with the seven levels. And really, uh, just if I was to help break it down, and I know you don't have the assessment in front of you, but you can quickly score it. And uh, again, we will send this to you. But if they're in a five or a seven, they're really in the fight stage. This is really a dominant part of their life. In three to four, they're trying to maintain control, but it's starting to escalate. And in the first and second stage, 
uh, they're really at the beginning part of this. And they might have viewed pornography a few times. They're starting to feel a little bit worried about it because it's feeling a little bit more compulsive. And so you want to be able to quickly assess, are they in the fight stage? Are they in the control stage? Are they in the prevention stage? And this kind of awareness can help you as an advisor know more about how to help them as they progress in their meetings with you. If they're at a higher level, they're going to need more support, which I'll be talking about in a minute. So here are some specific signs of addiction. One is it's a re they've had a recurrent failure to resist impulses. I wanted to stop, but haven't been able to. I've told myself over and over I'm going to stop, but I haven't. Then you start looking at more extensive and longer viewing. What was 15 minutes is now an hour. What used to be an hour is now two hours. What used to be two hours is half the day. And now it's almost all day, every day when I'm alone. So you want to understand what is the extent of how long are they viewing? That's a valuable understanding. The question of tolerance. In other words, what used to be stimulating to me no longer is. And what you find there is that they're trying to find and what we call increase the threshold of excitement. The tolerance is going up. Next uh, is an inordinate amount of time that's spent obtaining pornography, not just viewing it, but obtaining it. Now, again, this could go beyond pornography. If they're sexually acting out, sometimes people will spend a, a lot of time trying to what we call set the table for their sexual experience. And if that's the case, then it's becoming more dominant on their mind. The next part of it is they feel preoccupied with fantasy, thoughts, or preparatory activities. And so it's really becoming more and more a part of their life. They begin to disengage from social responsibilities, work responsibilities, and it's, they're be just, it's dominating their mind. If it's ongoing but unsuccessful efforts to stop, reduce, or control behavior. And then as we move forward, it takes time away from their obligations. A continuation of the behavior despite consequences. Lose their job. Their spouse is going to leave them. Those types of things. And it still continues. These are signs that it's an addiction. I'm going to use the word there. The higher a person scores on these types of questions, the more out of control their life is and the more compulsive the behavior is. Next is, a, and finally, a limit on social, occupational, recuperation recreational activities to view their porn. And right now I'm, I put porn there as the focus, but it could be and include other sexual behaviors. So those are um, the, those are most of the answers that we're looking for to have them address. And then finally, uh, the fourth, distress, restlessness, irritability. These are really withdrawal symptoms. And a lot of people say, can you have withdrawal symptoms from pornography or sexually acting out? And the answer is absolutely yes. A person can have body aches, headaches, sleeplessness. And sleeplessness is actually quite common when I work with individuals who are in the recovery process because their body is anticipating a relapse. And when they don't, there's some restlessness. And some people report body pain and headaches. So there's other uh, withdrawal symptoms. But these are the signs of addiction. And there's basically 10 of them, I believe, I've ad identified there. The, but the more accurate those are and the more consistent those are happening in their life, the more likely they are to need more help because they're truly suffering what appears to be addiction-like. So do they need more help than you can give them? A lot of people come to an advisor. This could be a religious leader. This could be a close friend. This could be a person who's a coach, whoever it is. And there's a time where we all have to ask the question, do they need more than I can give them? And so how do we know? And that is a question that we've had to break down here to our, even our agency to ask the question, what types of people are we most qualified to help? And how do we even better improve this? So questions that we ask, we assess them for depression, for anxiety, for elevated stress, for loneliness, and then depending on their sexual history, I may give them what is called the SDI, which um, because I've been trained to become a certified sexual addiction therapist, I have uh, been trained on giving them an in-depth sexual assessment called the SDI. Now, 
what I found is as leaders, advisors, we are sometimes not asking the right questions and we don't fully understand the extent of what these individuals are dealing with. So if we are going to help them, we truly need to understand, do they have ADD? Because if they have ADD and they're not being treated for it, their progression in healing from sexual addiction or sex healing and recovery is going to be limited because the ADD needs to be addressed as well. So if they have mental health issues like that, you would be well advised to refer them on to somebody who understands and can assess them. So for example, here at our agency, we've implemented an assessment strategy to really get the depth of their needs because what we've realized is they can't make progress without an accurate diagnosis and so we really need to pay attention to that and if you're an advisor and you have questions about that clearly it would be a good idea to get a good diagnosis and invite them to do so so if they have concerns about add depression high depression high anxiety we need to address those as well because typically what we if i if i could paint an iceberg picture right now i would want you to understand that the sexual behavior is the tip of the iceberg and underneath the iceberg are the issues that really should be addressed as well depression anxiety stress relationship conflict all those issues are are typically what's getting them to act out now if they need more then they typically have a longer history. And again, a person who's done something 500, 1,000, 1,500 times, they have a long history of this, and they've probably tried multiple times to quit and have been unsuccessful. So they need additional support. If they've failed multiple times, they need additional support. If they've tried in many different situations, but they seem to be stuck, even if they're meeting with you as an advisor and they seem to be stuck, then they're going to need more assistance. And especially if they feel hopeless, like it doesn't matter what I try, it's not working. Those are typically the times, those five things going on, mental health, long history, failure, no progress, hopelessness, that I say, if I'm an advisor, we need to get you more support. Now, I typically, going back to those levels, if there are five to seven and I'm, I'm an advisor, I typically say, let's get you more support and more help. If it's a three to four and I'm just meeting with them initially and I'm trying to understand and get their history, I'm going to monitor their progress closely. And if they're not making progress, I'm going to then advise them to get more professional help and more support. Now, I'm going to identify ways to get support because there are many different ways to get support. And I'm going to explain what I call the most effective ways to, it's called recovery capital. And I'll introduce that concept in terms of helping them understand a long-term recovery plan and what it really looks like. If they're a one and a two, that means that they've maybe seen pornography a few times in their life, but they're still a little bit anxious about it. They come to you, stay real close to them, give them some guidance. And I'll, I'll talk with you about some of the guidance that you can invite them to participate in. But those are the level breakdowns. If it's a five to seven, I clearly as an advisor, if I'm not professionally trained, I'm sending them to get more support. Three to four, I'm monitoring close. And if we're not making progress, I'm referring them on. One to two, stay close. And typically with the one to two, you can see a lot of progress with clear guidance and high expectations. Now, when and where uh, you can send them for proper help. And a lot of people have asked me this question over the years. Well, I've tried different agencies and there hasn't been success. I've tried you know, to talk with them. They've met with other advisors or religious leaders and they're not making progress. So where can we send them to get the right help? And I'm going to tell you, this is just based upon my experience of what's most effective. The more recovery capital we get, the more likely they are to be successful. So the more you do, the more success you'll have. That's a principle of what I call recovery capital. And what I found, and this was looking at addiction research across the board, drugs, alcohol, any type of addiction, the more they do, the more success. So what did the recovery capital find with people dealing with alcohol, with drugs? Here's what they found. Recovery capital is most effective when you have all of these things work together intertwined in the recovery process so many people will say well i tried a 12-step group and it didn't work well okay 
Would we really expect that a 12-step group all by itself is going to be the most effective for somebody who's been doing something for 30 years or 20 years? 12-step groups can be very effective, but they're a piece of the puzzle. They're not the puzzle. Getting a sponsor. Did you get a sponsor? Well, no, I just was going to 12-step groups. So you, had, you attended 12-step groups, but didn't get a sponsor. Now, most 12-step groups uh, are going to encourage some kind of sponsorship. Now, some don't, but many do. And that's a question you should ask. Do you have a sponsor? Now, that's two. Let's add one plus one. You get two. Now, suppose they're talking about with a trained therapist who specializes in treating sexual addiction. Now, think what we're adding to that. Not only are they doing 12-step group, they've got a sponsor. They're going to counseling. Wow, now they're getting more sustained support. Now, let's say they get educational group support. They're in group therapy, processing educational information. And let's add the fifth component. They're getting advisor support. They're coming to you for support. Now, let's put all of these things together. And now, what do we see? The recovery capital has increased, and their chance of success increases significantly. That's what the research shows. The more recovery capital you have, the more likely you are to succeed. So where to find professional help? I, I'll tell you that a person who's trained as a sexual addiction therapist has 120 hours of specific training in dealing with pornography and sexual addiction. Now contrast that with sending them to somebody who's been doing therapy for maybe 100 hours. They're, they're, I mean, just doing therapy. I'm talking about somebody who is trained, has experience, and in many areas, there are CSAT trained clinicians. And so regardless of where you are in the United States, Canada, there are people all over the world who are being trained as CSATs. In fact, when I was at my most recent training, there was a nice uh, gentleman from Australia who is there to be trained as a CSAT. So a CSAT is also trained on administering specific assessments like what we call the SDI, Sexual Dependence Inventory. And in the SDI, it's literally a two hour long assessment. And, and for individuals who I believe need more support and help, there's times where I give them that assessment. And what it does is it helps them understand this is a deeper problem. And it helps me understand where to intervene because it asks so many in-depth questions. So specialized training, somebody who's a CSAT, somebody who's a PhD who specializes in working with sexual addiction, or somebody who's had many clinical years of experience. That's ultimately what you're looking for, because you wouldn't send somebody to a car mechanic who doesn't understand cars. If you got a car problem, you're going to send them to somebody who specifically specializes in it. And that's one of the things as an advisor you should be looking for. I'm going to tell you, I've talked with so many people who said, I've been to professional counseling. And they didn't understand. They didn't really know what I was going through. So you want to make sure that they have specialized training. The next part of it is the iceberg concept. We really want to assess and address what's underneath the sexually acting out. And we want to be able to help them heal. So if they're dealing with major depression or if they're dealing with anxiety or ADD or they have other addictions, we really want to be able to assess that. So that's what a professional can do is really address some of that underneath stuff, the mental health issues, as well as that addiction component. So that's where professional counseling can really be beneficial to individuals who are stuck. Now, sometimes we think we can put a Band-Aid on it, but we can't. This is a life-changing opportunity for them. They're coming to you as an advisor. You want to give them clear guidance and clear direction so they understand this person not only cares about me, but they're getting me into the right people who understand me. And now I'm beginning to have more hope for recovery. That's a critical component. So the other part of it is education and emotional learning. As we look at recovery capital, the more education people get. In fact, last night I finished my final group. Uh, it's a six-week program that we do here at Adult Recovery for uh, individuals struggling with pornography or sexual addiction. I just finished it last night. And one of the participants I asked at the end of the class, I said, what has stuck out the most to you in this class? And he raised his hand and he said, the education has been so helpful to help me understand what's going on in my mind, to help me understand what's going on when I'm anxious, to help me understand what's going on in crucial moments. When you understand what's really going on, you realize that you're not some immoral person who's majorly flawed. 
The last message we want to send to individuals st struggling with pornography or sexual addiction is that they're awful people. With the right education, we help them understand. We don't shame them. We guide them lovingly towards healing and recovery. And then the emotional learning is helping them regulate their emotions, helping them understand how to deal with stressful times. If they're depressed, helping them with depression, because sometimes people are depressed and they act out sexually because they can't deal with the depression. So as professional help, that's what we try to offer, that kind of support where it's really underneath the tip of the iceberg. Now, finally, what should your expectations be for recovery? What should you expect? You're an advisor. They're coming to you. Well, here's a couple of core concepts that I've thought through over the years that would be most helpful for as we try to explain this. We first of all, we want to give them hope. We want to provide them clear expectations. We want to help them with accountability. And then we want to address the concept of peace. And I'll explain all four of these components. George Valiant, love this quote. If you want to treat an illness that has no easy cure, first of all, treat them with hope. I love the quote. Our job as an advisor is to give hope, clear direction, guidance. We want them to have hope. So in order for us to do that, we need to paint the picture of recovery. And as I stated earlier, research shows that most people overcome their addictions. Now, that's, that's not me just saying that. That's what the research shows. But the question is how? And that's where it goes back to the research, recovery capital. The more they're doing, the more likely they are to succeed because they're rewiring their brain. One of the things that we teach in our men's course is how to rewire the brain. I give very specific tools, ideas, and suggestions because I want them to know there's a science behind healing and recovery. So as an advisor, you can paint the picture, get the understanding. We had one advisor come through our class because he wanted to know how to talk with these individuals. He came through our men's course because he wanted to use that material. He wanted to understand how to help all the people he was advising. That's one way you can paint the picture of recovery. Understand it yourself. And the fact that you're here today, it tells me that you are invested and you care about helping the people that you have either a stewardship over or that you are trying to help. So I commend you for being here. Next, give them clear expectations. I love this quote by John Maxwell. People rise or fall to meet your level of expectations for them. I was talking with a religious leader um, after uh, it's kind of full circle. I talked with him and uh, he and I talked about having clear expectations. He developed these clear expectations for these individuals. And when I talked with the people he was working with, they said, this is the first religious leader that has given me clear direction, clear advice, clear expectations. And it's helped me because I know he expects me to do these things. The more expect, the more you get. Then as, as an advisor, and this quote by John Spaulding, those who believe in our ability do more than stimulate us. They create for us an atmosphere in which it becomes easier to succeed. We need to believe in them. And the way we believe in them is set high expectations. You can do this. Here's the standard. Here's what I believe you can do. And let's work to help you get there. Now, I know it's going to be a process, but I believe you can get there. So set high expectations, clear understanding of what you want them to do. Next is accountability. This is a crucial part. They need to have accountability. Who is on their team? If they are trying to do this solo or just with you, boy, that puts a lot of responsibility on you as an advisor, especially if you understand their history. They need a team. That's why a sponsor, that's why a 12-step group, that's why an educational group, that's why reading and learning, that's why having multiple people that they can talk to about their healing and recovery matters. Who is on their team? If it's just you, we need to expand the boundaries. Who can, else can be on their team? Now, let me tell you, it needs to be somebody that is safe. And I'll give you an example of this. I had one individual who said, I, you've got to talk with your parents. You've got to talk with your parents. He said that to every person that he met with. Well, this uh, young man said, reluctantly, I'll, I'll tell my parents, he told his parents, his mom in particular, for the next two weeks, sent him a writing on Holy Writ, 
from Holy Writ on repentance. Now, that's not what we're talking about here. Somebody who's on their team is somebody who genuinely can understand what their process is like. And when they're in need, they can get support. A sponsor is somebody who's able to say, thank you so much for calling. Thank you for reaching out. Thank you for coming to me. I'm here to help you. I'll never forget the story of one man who said I'd had multiple people say they wanted to help me. But finally, one guy put his arm around me and he said, I am here for you. And he said, yeah, I've heard that before. And the other guy said, no, you don't get it. He said, I'm going to every day, I'm going to call you. I'm going to ask, how are you? Are you doing okay? And if, if you haven't sent me a text, I'm going to expect one. I'll send you a text. And I'm only doing this because I care. He said, literally, that guy changed his life with love, not with shame. What you measure matters. How frequently have you been acting out? What are your goals? What is your sobriety plan? What are you learning in therapy? What is your, what is, who's your sponsor? How many sponsors do you have? Who or what are you learning in the 12-step group? What step are you on? Do you see the language here? What you measure matters. And then who are they sharing their successes and failures with? I love the concept of an accountability partner where they can share growth, progress, success, that even the successes, even the failures. And what you find is that type of accountability creates a relationship. In fact, I tell people, why don't, even as you get through this recovery process, why don't we continually have people that we say, hey, I, my goal this week is to get this job done at work or to do this in school. And I'm going to report to you next week. So I'm not just reporting to you whether I've been clean from pornography or not. I'm going to report to you whether I got this assignment turned in or how I did on my test or whether I finished this work project. Now, do you see this? We're creating a relationship and relationships help significantly in the recovery process. Next. As an advisor, if you're a spiritual advisor or religious leader, this question is extremely helpful. When is the last time you felt at peace? Now, if I was to ask you that question, I would be asking you to reflect. When is the last time you felt at peace? Now imagine the person that you're trying to help. Oh boy, it's been six months. What you also know is they need an arm around them. They need to be taught how to get to peace. Typically, they're shaming themselves. I found that individuals who struggle with pornography and sexual addiction struggle with their self-worth. They don't believe in themselves, their ability to control themselves, and they struggle with to find peace. Our goal, our hope, is that they're going to get to peace. And so we need to help them understand that as they take action, as they move forward, they will feel more peace. I cannot explain when you see clients who've just relapsed, their energy in contrast with people who've had weeks and months and even years of sobriety. The energy changes as people get away from the pornography and other sexual behaviors. They'll feel more peace and they know it and helping them painting the picture will be a very helpful thing. Now, today's objectives have been this, what questions you should ask, what are the signs of addiction and do they need more than you can give when and where you should send them for proper help. And then what should the expectations be for in recovery? I'm going to tell you the more you expect, the more you'll get. Now, you can go back and review this. I invite you to uh, have others watch it if, you, if they're advisors as well. This is a way that we as adult recovery are trying to give back to the community to help people know how to best help individuals, to give them hope. We all need to understand that the more we understand, the more we can help. So I want to um, close with just a couple of things. Um, I don't see any questions at this point, but uh, I just want to kind of give you a further overview. So today, week one was understanding pornography and sexual addiction. Next month, we'll be doing one on advising and helping uh, people who advise to help people deal with betrayal trauma. And in particular, if I'm generalizing here, this is going to be helping 
uh, people, especially women who are dealing with their partner's pornography or sexual addiction, although I realize it could be betrayal trauma the other way. Even parents can experience betrayal trauma or emotions of that kind of trauma when they have discovered their teen who's been involved. So I want to help explain and understand that. Then in the third month, supporting couples in crisis, fourth month, helping parents with trapped teens, and then guiding teens. You'll can be able to continue to get updates from us here at Edo Recovery. I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And I look forward to your participation later. If you have questions, feel free to email us. And I've got a little uh, email that you can go to. It's right here, advisor support at Addo Recovery. If you have any questions, you can also call us at 801-406-8994. I want to thank you very much for your participation. And it looks like I just had a question come in. So before I close, uh, it says, are you providing CEUs for this training? I, at this point, I have not. Um, I have not uh, applied for it to be a CEU, but if it, you think it would be uh, valuable for that, I could certainly see in the future if there is. But thank you for that question. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much for participating uh, with us today, and I wish you the best as you go forward in your work and role as an advice, advisor, counselor, religious leader. Thank you again for participating.